here's the donor's number. You should call them maybe, no, not maybe, you should call them. Donor Stewardship on this edition of the first day from the Fundraising School. I'm Bill Stanjukavich, and our guest today is Ann Fitzgerald, president and founder of AC Fitzgerald, an internationally recognized fundraising consulting firm headquartered in the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C. And Ann, thanks for coming back with us on the Fundraising School's podcast. Thank you, Bill. It's, it's a real honor to be here again. Now, you are have an extensive history in the philanthropic sector, and now you are sharing that wisdom through your consulting practice. How often does this topic of stewardship come up? What are you observing as you're working across the nonprofit sector, helping folks with fundraising and observing whether they are doing stewardship well or not? Well, it's a good question, Bill, because it's actually, I see it more in terms of organizations that are concerned about their retention efforts, and they realize they're not retaining donors as well as they would hope. So we start taking a look at what are the, the stewardship activities they're undertaking, and that's where we sometimes uncover a real need to up the stewardship game. So you're really seeing a gap in this practice, and why is donor stewardship so important? Well, you know, to back up, stewardship is, if you think of our fundraising cycle, we first are identifying donors, we move through the steps of research and, and cultivation, planning cultivation, we solicit a gift, hopefully successfully, and once that gift is received, that's when stewardship begins. And so it certainly includes things like the careful use of the money, making sure you know how you're using it. And I was looking at the Association of Fundraising Professionals, and they talk about stewardship, meaning a process whereby the nonprofit seeks to be worthy of future financial support or philanthropic support. But that's, I think, part of the equation. And I, I took a look at uh, Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, the book published by the Lilly School of Philanthropy. And I think they have a better, more deeper description where they reference about meeting the donor's gift intention and expectations in order to build a long-term, mutually beneficial relationship. So when we think about stewardship, we're thinking both about the gift itself, but also how we're managing that donor relationship. And to get to your uh, specific question, the, the reason this is so important is because stewardship is absolutely key to donor retention. As I was mentioning, this is a, an issue organization C. AFP's uh, fundraising effectiveness report has some really stark and uh, uh, you know, eye-popping uh, statistics when you look at it about retention and especially retention of new donors. Over 70% of new donors do not make a second gift to a nonprofit. So that, that's a, a very, very scary number when you think about the investment nonprofits make in acquisition, how they're acquiring donors through digital means or direct mail, and then it turns out in the end, they're not able to retain them. So they're really running in place. They're bringing in new donors, but they're not keeping them. And one other little uh, factoid is that if, if nonprofits could improve donor retention by just 10%, they would more than double the lifetime value of their donor database. So it's very, very powerful. And I think if I can continue there, the, the part of it is thinking about why donors don't, uh, don't, don't re come and give a second gift. And sometimes it's because they are lose interest or they don't have the ability, but many times it's because they haven't been thanked and they haven't been told how the money is going to be used or the nonprofit hasn't shared the impact that that gift could have. And to sum that up, if I had to put it on a bumper sticker or a coffee mug or the side of a Stanley uh, at the fundraising school, we talk about uh, donor stewardship as ways to honor and stay in touch with our donors in ways that don't always involve asking them for more money. Uh, and so, you know, either one of two things happens, we don't stay in touch with the donor, as Ann just described, or we stay in touch with the donor too much with asking again, asking again, asking again, as opposed to maintaining that long-term relationship. 
And uh, you talked about the different stages. And of course, at the fundraising school, you teach for us so well that 14 step fundraising cycle. Uh, what is the difference between cultivation, that stage, and solicitation, uh, and then donor stewardship? Sure. Well, when you think uh, cultivation stewardship uh, can be similar, there are similar things or similar actions you might take. But when we think about stewardship, as I mentioned, it starts when you receive the gift and it starts with thanking the donor. So I like to think about it. There, there's really two things. It's it is it is managing the receipt of the gift, but it's also managing the donor relationship. So when the gift comes in, managing the receipt of the gift is about processing it correctly, entering in your donor database, and importantly, using it in accordance with the donor's intent. So if the, if the money was given for a specific project, that money may need to be restricted in a special fund and certainly used for the, the reasons that the, the donor asked. But when it comes to managing the donor relationship, I think about it in three things. We need to acknowledge the donor, recognize the donor, and inform the donor. And the acknowledgement first is a thank you. And I think we we all sort of know that, that the first step to the next gift is the thank you. But I because we have so many donors give online today, and that's it changing, we are sometimes content with whatever that email thank you that goes out. And I recommend that everyone take a look at what is the, the email thank you that is being generated from your online portal. Because sometimes people haven't changed it. And, and it's not always heartfelt. Sometimes it's very transactional. You've made the gift, thank you, and uh, here's your IRS receipt. So we want to use best practices with acknowledging. We want to use the word you. We want to explain how the money will be used. We want to make sure that we we share a contact if for the donor to reach out to, not just info at, but a real contact within the organization. And we want to tell them what we're going to be doing and how we'll be touching them next. When it comes to recognition, we want to recognize where we are in the relationship with the donor. So perhaps the donor's in, at, given at a certain level and they're part of a giving society. Maybe that the gift is significant enough that it needs greater recognition, either a donor recognition wall or recognition at an event. So how should the donor be recognized becomes important too. Perhaps a milestone in their giving. Maybe you have a loyal donor is given many times and you want to thank them for the be, a donor for being a donor for five years or something. And then finally, the being informed. So that goes directly to donor communication. How are you informing the donor about the impact? And it's going to differ that in engagement with the donor is going to differ by the, the level of gift. And so we want to think about both wholesale activities uh, that everyone gets, such as uh, invitations to uh, webinars or to take a survey or to get your newsletter or versus more retail things for the higher level donors where it's highly personalized, such as maybe writing a, a thank you from a beneficiary of the gift that is very specific to that gift. And and that high level personalization, you know, instead of sending the pen or sending the certificate is find out what matters most to that particular donor. Now, in an annual fund and, and we receive, you know, hundreds of gifts, dozens of gifts, thousands of gifts. We can't always have that level of personalization, but especially when we're moving into the major gift category. You know, what is that person's hobby? What is their interest? Uh, are there some tokens that we can send along or include and write about in the thank you note uh, to really say that this is especially for you? We didn't just fire off and, and send you a form letter. And when we you, you gave us uh, many good tactics there, different things that fundraisers can do. When we think about the broader approach of a nonprofit and donor stewardship, what advice do you have for fundraisers in terms of creating that climate across the organization, ensuring that the CEO understands this, that the board understands this? So again, that there is a an organization-wide understanding of donor stewardship. Well, I think with any organization, it has to, it, stewardship has to be uh, intentional and internalized. And there overall, there has to be that attitude of gratitude. So are you are you truly a grateful organization? 
how how can you foster that within your organization? And you know, I believe it does start at the the level of the CEO, but certainly the the development team can be really instrumental in creating that environment. And that starts with the words we use. How do we how are we describing our donors? Are we are we talking about them in in terms of gratitude for for their gifts? Or are we talking more in a transactional way, like we got to hit that donor up for that gift or something like that? So we want to start that conversation. So throughout the organization, because really the whole organization is in in the gratitude business, the whole organization understands that people are giving voluntarily and that they want to see some tremendous impact that we can make. And we we have an obligation on many levels to provide that to them. One of our school's professors, Dr. Patrick Dwyer, is an expert on gratitude and not just the impact of gratitude on the person receiving the gratitude, but also the sender of the gratitude. It's really interesting that the fundraisers themselves benefit when they express gratitude. And to just you know amplify a point Anne made earlier in this conversation, uh, Dr. Dwyer's research shows that uh, when that message is saying, here's the impact that you helped make helpful, not just here's the impact in general, can have even a deeper, more profound effect on the donor. And uh, as you think about, again, the tactics that fundraisers and nonprofits can use, the approach that they can take, what advice do you have for nonprofits to get started or to deepen their abilities in donor stewardship? Well, stewardship has to happen at every level of gift. So we can't just think stewardship's gonna happen. Once they get to be a major donor, then stewardship kicks in. So what I would do first is just generally divide our donor base into three segments, new donors, loyal donors, and major donors. And new donors, when they come on board, we want to think about how do we welcome them? We And how do we continue to engage with them, maybe in a series of emails after they first give a gift? So we don't want to get that gift and then go dark on them. We want to engage them because remember, we, we, we don't want to accept that 70% of them will never give another gift. We've got to be better than that. So thinking about those those new donors and that that welcoming uh, experience that we want them to have. And then the loyal donors, this is the time to to talk about further engagement. They're already giving, but maybe they can volunteer. Maybe you can ask them to engage in social media or join a giving society. And then certainly the major donors, we tend to give them our most most of our time and attention, but let's be sure that we're really following up and doing that that gratitude in a way that is not just a a way to ask for the next gift immediately. The other thing I would just say, and I'd recommend this is look at your budget, the money that you're spending on acquisition. It's great. It's important. Some organizations spend thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in acquisition. Compare that to what you're specifically spending on stewardship. Sometimes we relegate stewardship to the person entering the, the gift in the database. At, or we we put the emphasis with the major gift officer in sort of dollars in the door, the gifts they receive, but there's no performance measures related to stewardship. And since this is so important, and the, the other benefits, of course, of having better donor retention is that you do not need to spend as much on acquisition. Plus, you'll have more donors available for capital campaigns or your plan giving program. So think about that investment and saying, can we flip this this formula a little bit and not just put money into acquisition, but also think about stewardship? And it actually can be less money invested per return on an existing donor than on acquiring a new donor. And when I teach for the fundraising school, I share my opinion. It's only my perspective that the most important person on the fund development team is that person entering and retrieving data from the donor database so that we can use that information well and wisely. Fundraisers can't be highly relational and informed with the folks they're meeting with without that good quality information. And we're also learning with artificial intelligence, there are now tools being embedded or that you can have work alongside your donor database 
that will summarize information about a donor, connect that donor's information to information from your programs that that particular donor could be most interested in. So especially if you're a smaller nonprofit, there are some now technology tools that can help you with donor stewardship as well. Now, listening to this podcast, you can see how brilliant Ann Fitzgerald is. That's why we hired her on our faculty. And that expertise and critical thinking was sharpened in part by the fact that Ann earned her master's degree at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. That is the college within which the fundraising school is embedded. So if you're interested in that master's degree or that doctoral degree in philanthropic leadership, please let us know on our website where you also find the fundraising school, our 24 public courses, four certificates, those are offered in 10 U.S. cities and anywhere across the world online, uh, both in a recorded modality and in a live version as well. We can custom make a course just for your nonprofit, just your association, just for your region, just for your country, all through our custom training programs. So we have quarterly webinars and, of course, these weekly podcasts. I love that Ann gave a shout out to Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, now out in the fifth edition all of this information available on our website at go.iu.edu forward slash TFRS for the fundraising school. And always great to work with you. I look forward to the next opportunity to do so. Likewise. Thanks to you, Bill. And our podcast today produced by Mike Anthony and Jennifer Boffman. I'm Bill Stanjakevich. And now you are now more fully informed on this first day from the fundraising school. Mm-hmm.